everything, every possible word has been used to describe my behavior, but uh, it never altered my idea of how I needed to conduct myself. So clearly, Dia had a good escape because she always had her guard up. But Troy, you have an image of a badass girl, at least in the films. <laughs> Do you think that would better any man or is it, is it the same everywhere? And have you ever had an experience like that or know of your colleague having an experience like that? You know, it's, um, it's funny that you asked me that because um, I had actually come to the uh, industry when I came to Bombay, much like uh, you, I was also, I'd only ever lived at home with my parents and, you know, from a university background in Delhi, so very uh, aware of terms and everything. But, you know, the real world is the real world. And I came thinking, ki, you know, I upbringing or values of sanskar I was waiting to see a proposition and everyone heard about the casting couch, casting couch. And I was like, yeah, I had a lecture prepared in my mind. And then when I came here, it was a year and I was like, I didn't ask me. What is this? Am I not good looking? Am I not? And then, no, it's really sad because then slowly I began to realize that I am just not recognizing it because we are so inured to handle things and to manage because bachpan se jab kuch bhi aisa aapke saath hota hai aapko koi bata nahi raha ki beta ye uh, sexual harassment hai aapko sab log yehi and I, I remember actually um, and it, it sort of it took me like it took me some six eight years where at a panel discussion like this listening to someone else talk about their experience of harassment, I was like, oh, three years ago, what happened with me, that sexual harassment at the workplace. And I never realized it because, like you said, I escaped because the person didn't touch me and because I managed to, you know, ward it off. And I just, I, to myself, I said, oh, you know, this director is being an excuse the expletive, whatever, gali. But that's not the full truth. The director is not just being an idiot or an ass or whatever. He's being a predator. And I'm not even being able to recognize that pattern of behavior because as a culture, we do not teach our girl children or our any children, boys and girls, to recognize predatory behavior for what it is. Because there is so much of a culture of silence around sexuality in India, around the issue of sexual harassment, actually not just in India, anywhere, everywhere in the world, that we're just going through our lives not recognizing it properly. So actually, uh, we just uh, recognize the discomfort. Yeah, uh, but, but we don't really de recognize what we it don't means. name it, right? For yeah, what we it never means. we never allow ourselves to label the experience. Yes, yes. But, but so is that something that's keeping the women away from actually coming out with their stories or even taking a legal action? I mean, I think there's a lot keeping women away from uh, uh, sharing their stories and taking legal action. Uh, and the first of those things starts with a uh, uh, completely inhospitable and hostile society and, and a culture of, uh, you know, um, as, as Anand sir said, a, a culture that actually actively or unconsciously enables predators, uh, as, as, as you also said. No, you, because that time you told me not to call you ma'am, so I'm, I'm not being able please to... call uh, me dear. No, but I'm very respectful. No, please call me dear. <laughs> but all the love I have, no, please call, call me dear. Me, what do I do? <laughs> so, as Dia ji said... No, no. What? <laughs> it's, uh, it's uh, you know, if you, if you come across as someone who's not, uh, you know, you're not nice enough, you're difficult, you're, uh, uh, you're, uh, you know, you're, uh, you're like a boy, you're like a tomboy, you're like, are yaar, tu to larka You start getting labeled, basically. So, I think that, uh, I think that there's a, you know, I think we should actually use this moment to not just, as Anand sir said, talk about the one predator who got caught and got glamorized and, you know, also consumable as a horror story. But we should really talk about uh, the culture that enables these predators to reach the positions of power that they do. And they're, they're everywhere in the world, in every country, in every society, in every form of workplace, not just in the media industry or in the film industry. And uh, so, yeah, I, I think it's also a question of making ourselves very, very aware of uh, the many things that go into uh, the legitimizing of predatory behavior. You know, 
interestingly, uh, what we saw in the film, uh, Harvey was denied for a very long period of time about all the allegations, but there came a point where he accepted and said he was an addict, and there were a few other influential people who came out and supported. Is there another side to the story as well to this, Mr. Patwajan, and would like to know that, do you think there are few people who are addicts, and is there something that is being missed out there? I think the other side of the story is not the, of course there are people who are addicts and they need treatment, uh, but the, the other side of the story is that one of the problems with the Me Too situation is that it is, once somebody is exposed, there's no trial, there's no, there's no defense, there's nobody, you don't hear the other side of the story at all. So. It, it is a media trial, it becomes, and that, that is a problematic thing. It doesn't mean that Me Too is bad. Me Too is wonderful in that sense that people are speaking out. But there will be, but there will be the occasional case where somebody is wrongly accused, and there's no remedy for that, and there's no easy remedy for that. Yeah, you wanted to add something to that? Exactly what Anand sir said. It, I think we run a very dangerous um, part of this becoming an undemocratic process. Because, um, yes, Me Too is about sharing stories, but the stories have ramifications and, it, it, and also come with great responsibility. Because if you're willing to share your story, you also have to, and there are very many women who have not just shared their stories, but have um, you know, if you look at all the stories in the Harvey Weinstein documentary, you very quickly acknowledge and appreciate the fact that every one of these women took the, some form of legal action. There were police complaints or, you know, complaints form filed with investigative agencies. And while he got away with impunity, given his powerful position, the, the reason why he could be brought down was because these investigations were done duly and diligently, not just by journalists, but by investigative agencies. And after a while, you couldn't, he, he himself couldn't deny the truth anymore, uh, which is why it became such a powerful movement. And I think that's a very important takeaway for me from this documentary, because I think with Me Too gathering momentum in India, um, it is essential for the movement and the future of the movement for three things to happen. One, for women to recognize and understand their position and to understand how they can use it effectively and democratically. And third, to, I think it would be very, I, I know our legal framework uh, is, is, has been framed and constructed in the manner that it has been, where it is actually biased for the woman, towards the woman. And that has been done very consciously, because we come from a country that has been grossly unjust to its women, which is why the law is in favor of the women. So the fact of the matter is that the moment a man's name is taken, he is assumed to be guilty until proven innocent. And I think that's what Anand sir means when he says that that's where we run a very, very thin line. It's, it's, a, it's very thin ice that we're walking on because there can also be individuals who can maliciously accuse another individual of sexual harassment without actually be, there being any truth to it. And what if in that instance, because there is a media um, a judgment made on that in individual by society because of a media trial, uh, that no real trial takes place, that no real investigation takes place. I think it undermines the movement and it un undermines what it is that women are really se seeking here through the movement, which is to you know, work in safe workplaces, to be treated equally at the workplace and, and, and to, be, you know, to, to get the opportunities we deserve on merit. You know, yeah, I, th I think it's really, it is, it's really hard. Uh, and there's a lot of difficult 
sort of issues that will come up, quite rightly, I think, which both of you all are pointing out. But I sometimes do, and I don't have a clear answer to this question. Because, you know, the thing is that it's when, when the reality and when, when um, largely speaking, the social, the norm is so uh, grossly skewed against the victim. The problem is that actually that process of even breaking that silence is a very hard process. Now it seems like, oh, you can just go on Twitter and write somebody's name. But that is not true. And that is not how it has been for many, many, many decades. Almost every victim who talks about, who actually comes to the point of taking a name and taking her name. So I'm especially talking about, uh, you know, it, everyone talks about how scared they were initially to lose their job because the thing is that this whole and it's a difficult issue i'm not denying i'm not i'm not denying what you're saying but i'm just saying that you know it is a very complicated issue i don't think there's any easy this way or that way because the fact of the matter remains and let us not forget this we're not talking about general sexual harassment we're talking about sexual harassment that is tied to your economic survival it is tied to the fact that you earn money and speaking out is going to damage your chances of whatever your life situation may be. It is going to damage your chances at at being able to forget career and ambition and success no, and all I'm very, very I, far away. I think women who stick their necks out and tell their stories where you can, you know their identity. I think that's, that's, yeah, I, I that's, think that's definitely commendable and deeply respected. I'm just saying that... We really, as women, need no, to insist. I agree with you for the future of the movement. Absolutely, but I think it is. You know, it is hard because I just I don't think that it was ever going to be nice. You know, it is. But it's it, never it, nice. It, that's what I'm saying. It's that never it, nice. There is going to be. You know, ultimately, it's also about creating a society where predatory behavior is shamed and it is not acceptable. How are we going to reach that point of collective agreement that you know this is not okay behavior? is only when the predators and the aggressors feel a little scared and ashamed ki yaar, you know, we, you know, you know, like it, it seems to me from this story that there was a certain confidence that this man had in knowing and, and you know, know, and I'm not, which is why I'm saying it's not about just individuals, it's also about the, all of us around them and we're all part of it, I'm part of it, I'm part of this society and this culture that, that silences, you know, that that kind of thoda aise like wash karo thoda side pe kar do theek hai nikal kar gaye nikal gaye all this we are all part of it so i think that it's, it's it really is hard and i'm i'm saying this from a very personal place one of the first people to uh, uh, you know i have I, I have some very people very close to me who got named in the me too as aggressors and it's been really hard to you know to go through this with them to watch them also have to reassess their own behavior. Thankfully, the person had not done anything very major and, you know, it's debatable ki achha ye isme aata hai ki nahi. But I'm just saying that, that so it's a, you know, it's a hard, it's, no, it's, it's a mess. It is a mess. And I think that we have to own up to that mess. And that's the only way out of it. And I, and I completely agree with you that I know it's hard, but really, I mean, to the girls out there, you know, if you can, and I don't want to be anyone to tell anyone what to do, but if you can, maybe don't put out an anonymous story. Because, you know, immediately there are so many haters out there and there's so many people who will try to, and I know it's hard because we don't know what you've been through and we don't know your trauma and we don't know your pain. But, you know, it's just, it's so easy to deny and discredit anonymous accounts, even if they're true. And that is the sad reality. So it's a, it's a hard thing and it's I'm something I'm not resolved about in my own mind completely. And I think that, yeah, I suppose we have to accept that, right? Yeah. And in fact, something that you pointed out earlier about inequality. I think in India, safety and security also remain one of the biggest issues, you know. And a lot of times, it, be it becomes difficult for even women in power to navigate through this. Do you think the women in power can actually do something about a situation like this? We've seen powerful men navigating through, you know, the mess that they create. But what about the women in power? And how is it that they can support? Okay, <laughs> that's assuming women in power don't abuse their power. Uh. 
Now I think women in power need to speak up. They need to join the conversation. They need to be a very proactive part of this narrative. Because if we hope to seek and find change, we all need to contribute to this narrative. And I think there are very, very conscious decisions that women in power need to take about not just the, the guidelines and the mandates they lay out for their male em, uh, employees, but also their female employees. Because I, do, I know that uh, just after the Me Too movement um, you know, started in India and gathered momentum in India, uh, there were a lot of checks and balances that we had to establish as a company. And we needed to form an ICC committee. And we, need to, we needed to start having conversations with uh, all our uh, team members, crew and cast. Um, and, and I think it's very essential uh, for all of us to continue to engage in this narrative and to continue to empower ourselves and those who we work with, with the knowledge and the information they need to ensure that they work in a secure work environment. Right. In fact, let's also discuss the other side. And Mr. Patwardhan, I would like to get your thoughts on this. Now, as a part of the tidal wave of Me Too movement, we saw false allegations. We saw wenging out, you know, personal vendetta. To what sense in the society, how much do you think it impacted the larger movement? When a false allegation comes, of course, it undermines the movement because you know people say, "Look, this was done for some political vendetta, or you know, somebody's name just because they happen to be you've got a you've got a grudge against them, and you do that." So occasionally that happens, and and it undermines the movement. But I don't think uh, the movement right now is undermined by that because these are few and far between. Okay. Um, we would like to know, do you think journalism uh, has evolved to take the matters of sexual harassment seriously without prejudice or uh, uninfluenced by past? In India? Yes. We have a lot of journalists here. <laughs> I know. I'm, asking, I'm actually looking at you because I want to know from you whether you think it has. I don't think it has. And I think all the journalists seated here will agree with me. I don't think we've reached that point of true, solid, investigative journalism that is unbiased. Um, I find that a lot of the reportage is very colored and deeply biased and undemocratic. I keep using that word because I think it's essential to the movement and the growth of the movement and the um, you know, the victory of the movement, which we are all seeking. Okay. Let's talk about the entertainment content, and what I'd like to get your thoughts on that. Do you think that plays a big role in desensitizing the audience about sexual harassment? Like you mentioned in the beginning, that you didn't even realize. And sometimes it just becomes so ingrained that you say, oh, this is a part and parcel of it. And do you think entertainment takes the credit for this? Absolutely. Absolutely, I think that we uh, uh, that the yeah the discredit uh, uh, rests quite squarely with popular um, entertainment in various languages. I think that mainstream films have played a very very detrimental role in um, in legitimizing and normalizing harassment, uh, especially stalking, giving it romantic color. And I've been in a film that was accused of doing just that, uh, and that's Ranjana. One of the biggest criticisms uh, or, or at, that were leveled at Ranjana was that it was glorifying stalking. And actually, I must uh, admit again that I, I remember at that time very passionately defending uh, the film. I think I even wrote an article about it, but that was probably because I was falling in love with Himanshu. So yeah, uh, <laughs> colored right there, uh, not entirely objective. But I think that in the years since, and both Manchu and I have spoken about it at length, I, I think that there was a lot of truth to that. And, and, and I know that he was doing it unconsciously while he was writing, and none of us realized it while we were, we were playing it out. Even, I remember my track, where I played Bindiya, right? And, and there's so much physicality between uh, uh, Kundan and Murari with Bindiya, where they're always tugging at her, hitting her, pulling her hair. And we were all doing it in this really fun kind of way, and I thought I'm also hitting them back 
so it's okay. But I don't think we realize that subconsciously you're actually playing into a, you know, into an, an, a narrative which is easily consumable as that noisy girl just, you know, whack her and make her shut up or whatever. So I think that as I, 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 I keep saying that, and this is really, I keep saying it and I'm saying it to myself, which is that, you know, we all have to start by asking questions of our own work. And I think that post Nirbhaya, uh, the, the whole discourse has changed and become a lot more conscious. And that's happened with beginning with the media. And that's why that those questions that have, have since then been asked of Hindi films have all come from, from yours, from the critics and from journalists and from conscious uh, audiences, right? Where now, even when I know this for sure, that when, when filmmakers and writers are writing scenes, they're suddenly more conscious. And they're like, yeah, ek bar ye le, is this okay? Is this seeming? So I think that, that that's a good thing. That is a good thing. And I think that, that uh, we should move towards uh, a society and a popular culture which is more aware, if, if nothing else. Do you want to add something? Yeah, I think Farah touched upon something very interesting that I'd like to highlight, which is that a lot of the behavior that we see in cinema is unconscious. Uh, and it starts with the writer, and then of course the filmmaker, and then the actor. And I think what is happening uh, now is that there is a conscious shift, of course, in society. People are becoming better aware. But to genuinely empower the kind of, the quality of writing, because I think for the last part, as audiences or as people, filmmakers, and Anand Shah, I think you would agree with me, we largely depend on the intellect and the knowledge base of the filmmakers, right? The people who are writing the, the narrative. And we hope that they will have the understanding and a deeper appreciation of what is equal, what is right, what is fair, etc. And, and that will then reflect in their filmmaking. But the unfortunate reality is that many, very many filmmakers and actors do not have that consciousness. They don't know better. They don't know when they are being misogynistic. They don't know when they are being sexist. They don't know when they are harassing. They don't know it. Um, I, and I think now is the time for communication to include what it is that is misogynistic, what is sexist, what is the you know, what is the behavior that emboldens and empowers uh, a certain predatory, predatory behavior? Um, why do men behave a certain way? I think these are very important conversations that have to be had. And these are conversations that need to really reach people who are at the core or the fulcrum of communication, whether it is in, in, in journalism and media or in, of course, uh, film and documentary or any other such art or medium that, that conveys mindsets of society and cultures. That's true. And in fact, fortunately or unfortunately, you know, we are also influenced by what we see in the films, what goes on in the mind of filmmakers. It actually reaches the consumers as well. Talking of filmmaking, uh, Mr. Patwal, then would like to know, uh, as a documentarian, if you had to deal with an issue like that, uh, what are the things that you would keep in mind while interviewing victims?